Welcome to the Callington Cluster. In this service, Gary Morris opens in prayer. Then the band Kingdom Come will lead us in worship with what a beautiful name. Margaret Morris will then do our reading today, which comes from Romans 12, and we'll talk on Romans 12. Then Gary Morris will close our service with the Lord's Prayer and prayers of intercession. If you enjoy this service, you can download it and keep it on your device. You can also find this service on YouTube. Let us pray. Father, we ask you to add your power and your inspiration to this podcast. Let you speak to your people through the music, the word and the prayers. Amen. You were the word at the beginning One with God the Lord Most High Christ thy King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. He didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus knew from Romans chapter 12 
verses 1 to 8. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, though many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. This passage is one of those parts of the Bible that I really connect with and was therefore so pleased to find it as the lectionary reading for today. It is practically based, which is always helpful when you are tasked with exploring it, which is my joy to do with you all. The verses are densely packed and require that we look at them phrase by phrase. So it may be useful for you to follow in your Bible if you have one to hand. As we do that, this passage will reward us with one treasure or nugget after another. Imagine a container filled with treats. Each time you pull one out, there is another underneath. This passage is rather like the gift that keeps on giving. Romans 12 begins with the word therefore, thus linking this chapter to what has gone before, namely Paul's systematic approach regarding God's grace and our faith. Now Paul re-emphasizes that our faith should issue forth in holy lives, that faith and faithfulness are forever linked. Paul is now offering practical counsel regarding faithful discipleship. Continuing in the first verse, we are called to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy, acceptable and pleasing to God. The Jewish law required the people to observe a complex system of animal sacrifices to atone for sin and to remind people of the significance of their sins. Only animals without blemish were acceptable as offerings. And the Christians in Rome, to whom Paul was writing to, are for the most part Gentiles and feel no obligation to offer animal sacrifices. Paul is saying that they have a sacrificial obligation that in fact surpasses the animal sacrifices. Christians are not required to substitute an animal's life for their own, but instead to sacrifice their own lives. The requirement is no longer ritual slaughter, but is instead the presentation of the living person to God. A life given to the service of God is a life committed to doing God's will, a life lived in faith, and lived out in faithfulness. This living self-sacrifice, Paul declares, is holy, acceptable and well-pleasing to God. Animal sacrifices were holy 
because they required taking something precious, a life, and offering it to God. The slaughter of the animal reminded the person that apart from the grace of God, it will be his or her life on the altar. Now Paul is telling the Roman Christians that it is, in, that it is indeed their lives which are required. Holy lives lived in accordance with God's will. The verse concludes with the words, which is our spiritual service. So our first treasure today is to be living sacrifices, not dead ones. Verse two tells us not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The word that is translated conformed has to do with confirmation that is malleable, that can change from day to day or year to year. So the person who is conformed to this world is free to embrace the next popular fad or philosophy. Being conformed is rather like a leaf blowing by the wind, never knowing exactly where you're going next or indeed why. But the word translated transformed, however, is quite different and involves transformation at the core of one's being. If being conformed would leave us adrift like a leaf, being transformed leaves us with feet firmly on the ground and anchored steadily. Paul is calling us not to be caught up in every fad or wafted by every breeze but instead to let the spirit transform us at the very core so that we have a faith strong enough to maintain course in spite of the winds of popular opinion. So what are the things of this age that mould and shape masses of people? This includes popular culture such as films, television, music and sport. And it can include philosophies such as New Age and PC thinking, including incentives to succeed, even at the expense of vulnerable people. Forces like racism, sectarianism and denominationalism that teach that our tribe and even our church is good and others are bad. There are surely many other examples of the things of this age that mould us into shapes not suited to the kingdom of God. Perhaps on our own we could meditate on this and see what comes to mind. In verse 1 we're called to give God our bodies and now we are called to give our minds. So it is by the grace of God and the work of the Holy Spirit that we who are one thing conformed to this age can be transformed into wholly different people who are godly and holy. Today we will be more likely to use the phrase change of heart rather than renewal of the mind. Paul however calls us to permit, permit the spirit to transform our minds knowing that the person who learns to think God thoughts will soon experience a changed heart as well. Godly thoughts transform every aspect of our being. For example, the person who adopts godly thinking is more likely to not engage in unhealthy practices, including workaholism, alcohol abuse, abuse and even worry and anxiety just to name a few. So let's just reflect on the statement in the last part of verse 2, so that you may prove what is the good, well-pleasing and perfect will of God. Are we doing anything that would displease God? Are we outside of his will? We need to constantly look at our lives. Are we speaking well of others? Do we build people up or knock them down? Are we behaving as we should? The list is endless. We are called to live holy lives. Let's make sure that all we do or say is honouring to him. 
We are ambassadors for him in every area of our lives. Nothing is secret from him. The world is full of people who assume God's will mirrors their own. People who try to force God into their mould of thinking. Denominations often assume that their particular slice of church has discovered truths that make them superior to other Christians. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to renew our thinking by almost becoming putty in his hands, so to speak, by allowing God to shape our thinking and our lives. Our second nugget is therefore to be transformed by the renewing of our minds and then to discern God's will, which is good, pleasing and perfect. In verse 3, Paul writes to the Roman Christians to think of themselves realistically and humbly and bases his appeal on the fact that any grace that he enjoys and gifts that they enjoy have been given by God. The person who is the beneficiary of a gift from God has no right to feel superior to another person who has received a different gift from God. Paul models the kind of life he is advocating. He approaches his readers humbly as fellow beneficiaries of God's grace. Paul had come from a background where Jews thought of themselves as God's chosen people, which was true, chosen for privilege rather than service, which was false. Paul wants to make sure that Christians don't take on that superior attitude. So our third little nugget is humility. We must never think of ourselves more highly than we should. Boasting is never a good quality, which I'm sure you would all agree with. When we move on to verse four, we see Paul using the analogy of the body of Christ to the human body, something he uses in 1 Corinthians 12, where he speaks of the interdependence of the various parts of the body. As we all know, each member of the body has a different purpose, but the various members do not compete for prominence, but cooperate for mutual benefit. So it is with the church, which has many members, each with differing gifts and able to contribute in particular ways, according to the grace given. Instead, we mustn't compete or quarrel among each, amongst each other, which would render the church body less effective for its mission to proclaim the gospel. Paul goes on to mention seven specific gifts, prophecy, serving, teaching, encouraging, giving, leading and showing mercy. As many of you know, they are not an exhaustive list and others can be found in Paul's letters to the churches in Corinth and Ephesus. The important thing with any gift is is to discover your gift and to use it wisely and well. Our next treasure is the receiving of our gifts, freely given to us by God himself. Now let me tell you a story. A few weeks after joining a church, a lady wished to use her gift of service, which she believed she had. She spoke to the leader and it was suggested she help serve refreshments after the service. This would be also useful as she would get to know people by speaking to them as she poured their drinks. Well, the appointed day arrived. It did not go well. First, she scolded herself on the boiler. Then a cup of tea was returned due to it being too weak. Then someone complained that the chocolate chocolate biscuits had run out and could some more be provided immediately. Whilst washing up, a saucer fell off the draining board and broke. What a morning. The wonderful church service which preceded this catalogue of disaster was now a distant memory and this poor lady could only think of all that had gone wrong and felt extremely disheartened. She was just collecting her coat, wondering if she ever dare set foot in this church again, when along comes 
and encourager. She thanked the lady for serving the church in this way so soon after arriving. She reassured her that the broken saucer didn't matter and of course she didn't need to pay for it. So lovely was she that the pair arranged to meet in the week to get to know each other better. Now that story didn't really happen, but it easily could have, because things don't always go well the first time we do something. Let's face it, I have had so many cooking disasters and burnt cakes that have ended up in the bin. I haven't given up, and the same should be said for our church ministry. None of us are perfect, and we shouldn't expect to be, and even more so, others shouldn't expect us to be. We should, though, always do our best because we are serving Christ himself. Serving God and encouraging others is so important and is a real blessing. Recently, a friend of mine had a great idea. She thought it would be good to replace the industrial tape that we were using to mark off the pews not being used due to the social distancing rules. And she thought, let's have some bunting. Having got permission from our church wardens, I approached the leader of the church craft group, who immediately started measuring up with a piece of string. Incredibly, they completed 14 sets of bunting by the following day. Making bunting is not my gift, but it is someone else's, and St Mary's looks so much better for it. The very last word in this passage is cheerfully, and our last nugget to take from this passage. Whatever we do for Christ should be done cheerfully. We are told elsewhere that the Lord loves a cheerful giver. When you serve, serve with joy, even if you've just scolded yourself on the water boiler. Can I encourage you to read more about these gifts? Open yourself to the leading of the Holy Spirit and pray that he will reveal his plans, his will for your life, as we looked at earlier, and the gifts which he eagerly desires to bestow upon you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word and the truth contained within it. Lead us on in our walk with you as we seek to serve you in however you call, in your holy and precious name. Amen. Dear Lord, we come together today as one body to praise and worship you as King of Kings, Lord of creation and our Saviour. Help us to remember that you give us your assurance of salvation. Let us not doubt your goodness towards us. We give thanks for the grace and mercy that you have shown to us through giving the life of your son on the cross that we may one day be in paradise with you and others that have found faith. We pray for our world. Whilst the virus is contained here, where we live, we remember those for whom the virus is a very big threat as it is spreading so rapidly. We pray especially for those people in the USA in Brazil, in India, and Russia. We pray that soon it will start to decline in these places where it is rampant. We pray for those suffering and for those who can only stand by and watch, for the carers and for the medical staff. Lord, please be with them in this crisis. We pray that the virus will not grow back again in a second wave. Lord, we pray for those around us in the towns and villages of our parish and beyond. We think especially of those who find themselves without work and those that fear the end of furlough coming up when they may be out of work. We pray that we may be ready to be the people you need us to be as we encounter them. Use us, Lord. May we echo the words of the song, 
here I am wholly available as we go about our everyday lives. We pray at this time for those involved in the transition process of selecting a new rector for the Callington Cluster. We pray for discernment and a unanimous endorsement of the right person for the appointment. We pray for those seeking the post, that they might have a clear call on their lives to come and minister here with us. We bring before you those on our minds that are unwell at this time, maybe in mind or body, or those who just need support. We think of those names on our prayer list, for Terry and Joyce Fuller, Hazel Jones, Roy Cooper, Raymond Chudley. We also pray for those who have lost people close to their hearts in recent times. Lord, grant them your peace and reassurance. We offer all these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Will you join with me now as we say the Lord's Prayer? I'll say the traditional version. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining us. If this blessed you today, then our other resources on our website may be of interest to you. And share with your friends and family. Please do join us for our next podcast.